say my name is Albert Park. I'm the director of the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology Institute for Emerging Market Studies, and I'm going to I'm moderating today's uh, event. And uh, the first speaker you heard was Ashish Mehta, who is an associate professor of economic development uh, at UC Santa Barbara, University of California at Santa Barbara, uh, and an expert on uh, skills issues and structural change in Asia including India, and Joanna Silva is a senior economist at the World Bank Office of the Chief Economist for Latin America and the Caribbean, and has, uh, was a team leader for a major report on sustaining employment and wage growth in Brazil. And uh, Prashant Loyalka is our third speaker. He's an assistant professor at the Graduate School of Education at Stanford. Uh, and a center research fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for National Studies there and has been participating in a number of studies of vocational education and other aspects of inequality uh, to educational access in, in China. And today we want to focus a bit on talking about the role of vocational education uh, in, in such economies. Um, so we're very happy to have experts from really three, the three largest uh, emerging markets by population. Uh, so, uh, in today's talk, I want to first talk a little bit about the demand side and then switch to the supply side. So, in terms of the demand side, uh, we'd like to understand better which skills are in short supply in different emerging markets and how the demand for skills uh, may be changing over time. So, let me ask Ashish maybe to comment first about his, uh, his views of this issue uh, in India. Ashish? Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Albert. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so uh, I want to try to just place this a little bit theoretically before we get into India. And the, the, the basic issue is this. Um, different types of sectors conducting different kinds of economic activity require different kinds of skills. And so depending on what's growing and whether it's growing in terms of productivity or simply just absorbing labor, you're going to get different patterns of skill demand in different economies. Okay, so this is something we looked at uh, at some length in the build-up to the Asian Development Bank's Key Indicators 2015 chapter, um, where we basically asked, if you look across a range of Asian economies, I'll come to India in a second, but let me just start with a bit of overview, right? Um, and you try to look at um, exactly how changes in the structure of these economies and the sources of productivity growth, uh, in a sense, correlate to, uh, to patterns of skill demand, you, you get some pretty clear pictures, okay? So the first thing to note is if you think about services versus industrial growth, services tends to be the sector that uh, uses a uh, lot more, um, a lot more general education, tends to be a bit more focused on English language, particularly in the modern services, and modern college, and tends to use, um, tends to rely on a high quality of general education. The so quality of general education really matters in the high end of the services sector. You contrast that uh, with the industrial sector and people making things with their hands, the good sector, so you think manufacturing, construction, mining, and agriculture, although that becomes its own sort of can of worms. Um, people doing things with their hands, these are the sectors where you're going to see more demand for vocational education. And so depending on which sectors are growing, you're going to see things work quite differently. Um, so, quickly, if you think about what's happened in a few different economies, you look at Pakistan, where, where structural transformation has proceeded very, very slowly. The movement out of agriculture into services and manufacturing has happened very slowly. Um, there has been very little change in the demand structures for skills, period. Whether you're looking at where people work or what they're paid relative to people working in other sectors or possessing other skills. Uh, you look at Thailand, Thailand slowly easing into a services-led model, but productivity and services hasn't grown. So what you see is declining returns to secondary and tertiary education, general education, and not a lot of jobs being created in the goods sector, so not a lot of increased demand for vocational training. You get to Vietnam, and you see rapid manufacturing productivity growth without much job creation in the manufacturing sector. So high wages in in, in manufacturing, but not particularly rapid growth in the returns to vocational education. Right? Uh, instead, you see their education rapidly being drawn into state jobs. Right? So, so, so these patterns really matter. You come to India, and here you see a big, big, vari 
big difference between what the government and big industry is telling us is going to be the future of skill demand, namely it's going to be uh, vocational skills for industrial development and what's actually happening which is you've got high levels of services uh, led growth with a significant amount of the jobs in actually low, low skill services, right? Also growth in high skill services but therefore a bifurcated uh, skills demand landscape where people who get high quality education in English language go to higher education seem to be doing quite well and the rest because they're suffering from low quality basic education have to figure out how to do things in a services sector where there isn't much demand and so all the resources being pushed into into uh, vocational training disproportionately end up going into services but not doing a whole lot of good because the demand for skill isn't quite there in the low end services great so that's sorry a bit of a long overview no no that's that's very interesting so i mean it's really suggesting that sometimes what the government thinks are the skill demands are not the actual skill demands in the economy and so it's kind of a chicken or egg thing maybe they expect these sectors to grow but if they don't then you have really a problem if you've been made these uh, investments in uh, tra training so Jana, Joanna can you pick it up maybe and say a little bit about your views of, about how this is working out in Brazil in Brazil from our study what we found is that the package of the right worker for firms is increasingly complex in Brazil, it was very clear that increasing more the technical skills per se wouldn't be enough to increase the productivity of firms um, because the, the package of uh, or the, the, the skill package included much more now non-cognitive skills as well as cognitive skills. So the importance of social emotional skills is, uh, is growing in Brazil and in most countries in Latin America. This has to do with the ability of working in teams uh, uh, accountability to clients, ability to, co to coordinate with others. So these are skills that are very, very important and complementary to this purely technical skills. So this was something that was very clear in Brazil. The second thing was that in Brazil, in contrast to on what happens in the US, for example, where routine tasks that are in the middle of the wage distribution are the ones that are being uh, um, decreasing in terms of employment shares, uh, in Brazil is not the case. We don't see these U-shaped uh, um, employment, changing employment shares throughout the skill distribution. So this idea of the substitution of uh, routing tasks, of workers doing routing tasks by machines is kind of, mm, is not so clear. This polarization is not so clear in, uh, in Brazil and in other countries in Latin America, which should suggest a, a strong complementarity between um, these routine tasks and also the social skills, possibly a negative correlation between these two. The third point that we saw in that report was that specifically for the poor, um, Brazil had a very good decade in the 2000s and many poor made it to the formal labor markets. However, when we look at who got the formal jobs, they were concentrated in one group, the young who had finished high school whereas for the non-poor they were distributed in different ages and different education. So particularly for the poor, it is very important to be well equipped with a skill set that uh, in order to, to get to better jobs and then keeping those jobs. Uh, Joanna, I want to follow up a little bit because you said that uh, the non-cognitive skills are also very important now in Brazil mm -hmm. and I was wondering what implication that has for vocational training. Is that something that vocational training can include or does that require a real rethinking of training strategies? It, it does require rethinking but it can include uh, this type of, of uh, it can, so it's, if it is strictly in classroom uh, very very focused on, uh, on, uh, on lecturing and listening to a professor and more, more on, um, on, uh, on strictly technical skills it won't cover this, but um, there are trainings in the world where these social emotional skills have been uh, have been part of these trainings. Things like helping people uh, organizing the CV, um, making um, try to making it more a club like rather than a, cl a classroom like environment. So it's kind of new pedagogies that are more adapted to this type of uh, of skills. Right. And you also su suggested that the poor didn't benefit as much from uh, the jobs created in the recent expansion in Brazil. 
Does that mean you think that the vocational training is more relevant to, to that group because they're in the, some of the more kind of less skill intensive job areas? The, the poor benefited quite a lot from the expansion in Brazil of the formal labor market in the, in the years 2000. The, 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 actually, in, in Brazil, like in most Latin American countries, the wages that increased the most were the wages of the unskilled workers, not the wages of the skilled right. workers. Now, what was different I, between the poor and non-poor in terms of the insertion in, form, in the formal labor markets in, in the higher paid jobs in Brazil was that those among the poor, most of those who made it to the formal labor markets were in one group. They were young workers who had finished um, high school. Whereas for the non-poor, they were divided across ages and different uh, education profiles. So the, the training and the education is particularly important for, for ensuring this transition of the poor to better lives in a sustainable way. Um, and this type of social emotional skills are particularly important in these more disadvantaged groups as well. Great, thank you. And uh, finally, Prashant, uh, what is your sense about how the demands for skills are changing in China? Um, yes, thanks, Albert, and thanks for the invitation. Hi, everyone. Um, just like Albert had mentioned before, you know, China's uh, labor market, like a lot of advanced countries and a lot of countries trying to move uh, from being middle income countries to high income countries is really uh, trying to shift from these lower value added, lower productivity industries to higher productivity industries, both in manufacturing and in services. And so what this has done is it gradually it's put this pressure to try to diversify into you know, jobs that require more sort of analytical, non-routine types of skills rather than the routine uh, everyday manual skills that we've gotten used to seeing in China from it being something like the factory uh, for the world. Um, another pressure on China right now, though, is that uh, there is a shortage of labor in general, uh, not just for skilled labor, but for unskilled labor. And this has really driven wages up, uh, which have been skyrocketing in recent years, uh, such that a junior high school dropout can make an initial salary that's very close to a college graduate. Um, and because of this type of pressure, uh, wages are increasing in China. Uh, the idea that manufacturing firms are going to stay uh, and you know uh, keep their uh, keep their uh, operation going in China is is somewhat in doubt, and so there's some movement of factories to uh, inland China, but there's also a lot of movement to places like Vietnam uh, and and Indonesia and other countries, and so I think China faces that pressure to diversify and to have uh, a, d a greater demand uh, in the longer term. Uh, for workers that have more flexible skills. Right. But you're saying there's plenty of labor demand in China, which maybe is in contrast to uh, some, some other places. So maybe the issue for whether to do vocational education is not necessarily just about, you know, helping people get jobs, but really helping people just be more productive and get better, uh, better quality jobs. Um, so right. um, do you have any thoughts about whether in this context China should be focusing much on vocational education or whether all the emphasis should be on general education? Um, this is, of yeah. course, a long-standing debate, I think, uh, right. in terms of education uh, policy. Totally. Thank you. There's a couple of important issues there, I think. One is that China has its aging population, uh, which a lot of people know about. Um, but the other issue is really the fact that China is actually, even though it's made these great progress from, uh, you know, in expanding college education and high school education for a large number of people, it started ex that expansion from very low levels. And so, if you look at the labor uh, force in China today, uh, the working population, you find that only 24 percent have had some type of high school uh, experience. So, not even that they graduated high school and a much smaller percentage have a college education. And so when you're thinking about, you know, what type of high school education general versus vocational or what type of college education to give graduates, I think that's really secondary to the idea of trying to have a much more uh, educated labor force. I mean, China's uh, really far behind other large emerging markets. Uh, it's at the same level as Indonesia, behind South Africa, behind Brazil. Um, Speaking to like what kind of skills I think that uh, people should be learning in China because we have this problem 
of China having to shift very quickly to become a high productivity uh, economy, I, I think that really you do need skills that are not just for today, not just for what industry wants today, but really for 15 to 20 years from now. And I can talk about this later, but what we're finding is that students in vocational high schools today are really not learning, uh, really not learning the types of skills that you would think would be necessary for 15, 20 years from now, things like English and mathematics. Uh, and, and science at the high school level, uh, things that they could use when the economy is much different from the economy today. Great, thank you. So, uh, uh, do um, Ashish and uh, Joanna, do you want to come in on this issue about the balance uh, between vocational versus general education planning for the long term versus trying to train people for the jobs that there's currently demand for in the economy? In terms of the, the vocational training, this, this, uh, this, the need to adapt to the, to the demand is really crucial because uh, is, is really, is the, these workers are, 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 are if, if it is a short, a short duration course and if you trace who the ones who make it then after the course to the, to, the, to, the war, to the jobs and increase their wages, you see that there is demand. Um, so what we say in, in this report on Brazil and that we observe is a bit this idea that uh, it, rather than guessing demand, it's very important that the trainings trace the results of their students and, and looking at those results adapt uh, to, the demand, uh, to the demands of the job market. So if you are training, if one particular training um, the, in these short duration trainings has no, no impact on wages and there are no insertions in the in the labor markets, then it needs to be reassessed the content and the, and the, um, and the, the the methodologies and the, the need for uh, for that for that course. So really, this idea is very important. The other thing is really this different role between the the two the vocational training in Brazil. This is very clear: technical education, general education, and vocational training fulfill very different roles. Um, and uh, and in the case of vocational training, a large part is really um, targeting um, people who are already working in the firms, and there are some consortia, some agreements, partnerships between the firms and the training providers um, that where on demand these these courses are provided, um, and uh, and really in those cases is very geared towards the jo the labor market for existing workforce. Whereas in the case of general education and technical education, it's for current students. So all the part on adult education for those already working is more uh, centered in the vocational training. And that there, there, there is a very important role for uh, for vocational training, um, as well as for strong articulation with the firms, with the private sector. Okay, great. Ashish, do you want to add anything? Yeah, sure. Um, so it, it does sound like Brazil's doing a better job on one of the key things we need here, which is better better articulation, as Joanna says, between firms and training institutions, right? And so what uh, what 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 we're seeing happening in India is more pre-service vocational training, uh, which often seems to have lower lower uh, workers once they get out of out of these programs tend to have lower retention rates. Uh, and so there's a much, much, much looser set of connections in terms of the incentives of employers to uh, invest in workers, retain workers, uh, help help create those skills. Um, now, as far as the general versus 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 vocational education, um, I I think what's what's really what's really going on here um, is that general education does provide the basic foundational skills that it takes to actually. Uh, function in a number of these jobs. A lot of the non-cognitive skills that Joanna is talking about are developed early on in non-cognitive education. Um, the people who are now being targeted for vocational training are generally people who have been to poorer quality uh, primary and secondary schools. Um, and so this is this is a band-aid. This is, this is an attempt to try and make up for the fact that they've been denied a decent education. Now you try to um, try, try to fix it with vocational training. Um, and it it doesn't quite solve the problem because in India the jobs of the future are not yet in the main going to be high tech jobs as they are in China. Um, many of them are going to be services jobs. They're going to involve interpersonal communication and so on. 
And so you can't really, um, there, there, is, there is no substitute in India as in China now for quality basic education to train people for that kind of work and enable them to actually mediate. You know, this is the difference between getting a job working as somebody's made and getting a job where you can actually rise into management in a bigger organization. Great. So uh, let me turn the discussion a little bit more now to the supply side and what the vocational systems kind of look like in these uh, different countries. Um, so actually, I, I wanted to follow up with Joanna because you said that there's this clear division where you have the vocational schools, the technical schools, and the general education schools. I think in China, uh, that the technical schools would be viewed as vocational schools. And so uh, I'm not sure. So maybe I'm not sure we we're talking about a real uh, a, a real difference or a semantic difference in terms of how these are are, are labeled. But um, what is the nature of the technical schools versus the uh, versus the general education schools? And can you just describe in general kind of what the vocational and technical training system looks like, and what are the key issues confronting uh, Brazil that they are contemplating? Sure. So in Brazil, the the technical education is very different from the vocational education. So um, there is the general education, and you can transit from the general education as a student to the technical education. These are longer duration courses uh, of several years. Uh, there is th this is different from the vocational training, which is short duration courses plus apprenticeships, where you do a combination of a training with also time at the firm, work experience. So the vocational training has courses of different duration, but is is shorter, is, is significantly shorter than technical education, and they are more geared at people who are currently working, except for the apprenticeships, which is supposed to be your entry door into the the labor market. So a very different type of, of setting. Among the providers, for vocational training, most of the, the courses are provided by the, uh, the training arm of the Confederation of Industry. So firms pay a tax uh, that finances this training arm of the Confederation of Industry. This has a uh, part for industry, a part for commerce, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and they provide training to the firms in these sectors. Um, so, uh, so because it's so articulated with the uh, with the uh, the industry itself, um, this, this 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 I think is one of the reasons why uh, in our study we, we found very positive returns to training and high insertion rates among uh, the people who do, who complete vocational training. Now, technical education used to be more uh, an elite tra track. The returns are also quite high, but most of the students were from. Uh, uh, high social economical backgrounds, and there was an explicit attempt with Pronatec from Brazil since 2012 to get more people from uh, from poorest backgrounds into technical education and vocational training. This Pronatec was a very large uh, program that the government uh, had, um, and uh, and uh, the idea was really that more 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 among the poor, more people would engage in this and. 40% of the vacancies uh, were of this this uh, this program were for were specifically for the poor. So nowadays, technical education is more balanced in terms of the social economic background of their students. But it used to be an elite tr uh, track um, for for those in, in school. They would complete the general education up to a certain point, and then they would do uh, the rest of the education in a technical school. So what kind of things would they be? University, for example. Uh, what kind of things that would they be studying in technical schools typically, like trade skills, or yeah. electronics, or these kind of things? Exactly. Okay. Whereas the the short courses are very specific, are um, training yourself in a, a specific uh, technique for being a better colorist if you are uh, in working in the car business or something like that. So they are very technically specific whether the others are also technical, but uh, uh, that would, uh, would, uh, would be useful in many jobs, not just those specific occupations. OK. Um, let me bring it over to Prashant then. Prashant, what is, how does vocational education work in China? Um, yeah, so vocational education in China is basically at the high school level. 
and at also the college level. So China has, uh, after junior high school, an entrance exam into academic high school. And people that score well on that uh, entrance exam can essentially qualify to go to academic high school. Uh, if you don't qualify to go to academic high school, uh, you can go to vocational high school or you can go into the labor market directly. Uh, right now, China's government has tried to set uh, quotas such that about 50% uh, of the high school goers can go to academic high school. Uh, most of those uh, students end up going to college about 80%, and the other 50% uh, go to vocational high school. Uh, vocational high school is about three years long. Uh, it's two years of courses. One year is supposed to be for general skills like math and science and English and Chinese. Uh, the next year is supposed to be for vocational specific skills. Uh, you find a lot of variation in what actually happens across schools, though, in terms of the curricula. Uh, and then finally, in the third year, there's supposed to be an internship uh, that the student takes with the firm. And uh, it could be a group of students going together. It could be an individual student. But they are supposed to be accompanied, for example, by a teacher. Uh, and hopefully, the internship is supposed to be relevant to what the student had uh, studied. Uh, in, in their first two years of the program. Right. OK, great. So, and I think in China, there are, there are also short-term kind of vocational skill training programs run by different government ministries. I think less so trade associations. So that's an interesting difference from the Brazil model. But otherwise, you know, what you're describing as vocational education in China it seems similar to technical uh, education in uh, Brazil. Now you've been done, done some work evaluating the uh, performance of these vocations. What are the main challenges you see for vocation, these vocational high schools and colleges in China? Sure, uh, thanks for asking. We've done a lot of large-scale studies of uh, vocational schools in eastern, central, and western China. So by large-scale studies, I mean we've gone and uh, surveyed students at hundreds of schools, tens of thousands of students. And we've also tried to uh, assess over time how much the students are learning uh, in terms of their specific vocational skills that's uh, the major they're taking, as well as their general skills, such as math and reading and so forth, and even their non-cognitive skills. Uh, we've done a, done a lot of work with qualitative interviews and quantitative uh, research data collection to look at you know, what's happening in the classroom. Uh, you know, how are students behaving? How are they interacting with the teachers? What are the teachers doing? Um, and so some of the interesting things that we found, um, in number one, we find in all of the different regions of China that we've surveyed, on average, uh, students in vocational school, schools are learning uh, basically no vocational schools over time, vocational skills over time, excuse me. Uh, so, you know, they're taking a certain major, for example, computing or something to do with electronics, and you give them a test at the beginning of the year. Uh, after one year and after two years, and you see absolutely no gains in terms of their knowledge. Um, now, of course, knowledge is one uh, part of what maybe a vocational training offers, um, but in addition to that, uh, for example, we see a lot of dissatisfaction among students. We see very high dropout rates uh, in excess of 10% per year. Uh, we see that students are very unsatisfied with their internships in the third year. Um, they you know, report that a lot of these sort of government regulations about having safe internships that can help students thrive, uh, those rules really aren't being followed. Their teachers aren't going with them. Their uh, major and their internship really have nothing to do with each other. Uh, there's sometimes third party brokers that take advantage of the students and charge a fee uh, and so forth. And in the classroom itself, we see a lot of uh, sort of not very good behaviors, not the typical things you would expect from a Chinese classroom that's well disciplined. Um, there's lots of reports of bullying, of smoking, of drinking. Okay, I, I think we get the picture. So it's not, yeah. it's a pretty big picture actually what you found. So I'm curious, I mean, that suggests there's some basic kind of uh, incentive problem in terms of the delivery of these services in China that maybe is different than public schools. What do you think is driving institutionally, kind of driving this poor performance? Yeah, I think you hit it right on the head. I think that we've tried to evaluate a lot of reasons why a vocational school is not working and what might help to improve vocational schooling. And what we really see is that there's a lack of assessment and accountability, assessment and accountability that exists in other parts of the general schooling system, for example, in academic high school. 
um, but you really don't have that for vocational schooling. Um, and one of the things be behind vocational schooling is that it grew very fast. Uh, there were lots of investments into it uh, in the last, say, 10 years. Uh, during the last decade, uh, the enrollments doubled from like 11 million to 20 million. Uh, investments increased by six times. Uh, one of the things that the government did is that for every student, they essentially paid for most of the tuition of going to vocational school so that, you know, poor students could go, anyone essentially could be able to go to vocational school. And so with this sort of um, so-called voucher that students had to be able to go to vocational school, I think there was a great eagerness to get students, but not necessarily any accountability for how well the students, uh, how well the students were trained by the schools. Um, right, so I'm, I'm seeing maybe one of the issues here in the performance is that it's all top down from government quotas to government plans we're going to expand. And it echoes a little bit what uh, Ashish was saying uh, about the Indian system, maybe that there were certain expectations on the government side that drove the design of these public uh, public training programs. Ashish, do you want to say a little bit more about how vocational education works in practice in India and the key uh, challenges that you see? Sure. So uh, it, uh, it it's it's interesting to 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 really see these inter-country comparisons. What happens in India is so vocational training until fairly recently uh, was basically state subsidized, state delivered. Um, now, since around 2014, we've started to see this expansion in state, state subsidized, state financed, uh, largely privately delivered uh, vocational training. And so that's, that's the sector that's exploding. Um, education is a state subject, so there is variation across the states of India. Uh, so that's not really feasible to sort of say this is how it, vocational education works in India in general. Um, but it it is typically done at the at the upper secondary level, uh, some junior college level. Right? Um, it uh, initially began with uh, a, a fairly large amount of state subsidies. The state subsidies, and I'm talking now starting from 2014, um, the state subsidies uh, still continue. Uh, but there is talk as because the numbers of people that the government is targeted for skilling are so large, the government is talking about moving to other kinds of financing models where students will start to pay more, etc. Um, so there's that. Um, there is a certain amount of corporate involvement in in skilling, and this comes uh, in in from 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 some two sets of forces. One is that um, there are uh, there are schemes that uh, so so companies have to pay about one roughly depending on how, how you calculate 1.5 percent of the of their annual annual profits. Uh, they have to dedicate them to some sort of socially responsible investment. Um, so. Uh, these CSR funds increasingly now start to go towards some kind of skilling program. It's an attractive way to spend the money. You can invest in the skills of your suppliers and so on and so forth. Um, so a lot of private money going into it. Uh, and there is a lot of talk about, you know, where is the demand for skill training on the part of youth? Why, why aren't sort of young people more interested in this? Don't they understand that there's great jobs to be had, etc.? Um, and the question that's very much on the table is, can those claims be backed with, with systematically collected data, or is it sort of anecdotal that there are a few good jobs to be had in these ways? Um, so what you see broadly is a very, very wide variation in the quality of uh, vocational training that is actually delivered. Um, in places where there are, we have seen this in some, indus in some industrial, industrial towns, one in particular I think of that does a lot of automotive work, uh, where you actually see a lot of interest on the part of firms in coordinating with the local, local institutions, training institutions. They say, well, it's kind of difficult to make this happen. We wish it could happen better, but we're trying. Um, that's one sort of model, and you can see it's demand-driven when you look at what the firms are doing. It's heavy industry. Uh, they keep their workers around for a longer time, and there are strong incentives to, to invest in this. Um, there are other places where you're not seeing that happen quite as quite as obviously, and these tend to be firms that are sort of churning out sort of the standing army of workers to go into menial service jobs. And so it's a wide variety of, of, of models, of incentives, and I think at 
on some level, maybe I'm being fundamentalist about this, but at some level, it starts with, is there demand for the skill or not? And when there is, then we get to the secondary set of issues of how to structure the incentives to make sure that uh, employers, workers, and trainers all have skin in the game. OK, so you're emphasizing the ability of these uh, local governments to link the supply to the demand as kind of a key aspect of success. So let me bring it back to Joanna. I, um, I want when you describe the Brazilian system, it actually sounded uh, quite good that there's high returns to both vocational uh, schooling and to uh, technical schooling. Um, I was one, and then the only thing that you had mentioned earlier as a kind of a key challenge was adding more non-cognitive skill training. Um, are there other issues that you see facing? And, and, and also, I'm curious about how the technical schools address this uh, kind of linkage to the demand side. Are they providing, are there, why are their graduates uh, being able to do so well in the labor market? And how do they decide on what the content of the training should be? So, uh, so the, in Brazil, the linkage with the private sector comes a lot from the fact that the the train the main trainer pro training provider is and the training arm of the Confederation of Industry. So that that helps a lot. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, articulation with the demand and cost effectiveness, um, can you hear me well? Can you hear me well? Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, I think it's okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I was hearing my echo, so I was, I was not a bit too much sure. So, so in Brazil, this culture of uh, of tracing results because it, this is an expensive system, so it's important to show results. And uh, this idea of understanding whether the students do get into jobs and whether they raise their wages as a consequence of training. Is, is really something that uh, they put in the back of, in the mind of the population of industry, for example, and also of the government when they program Tronatech. Now, this is a, a very happy story also because, because of the moment that Brazil was living in the 2000s, employment was growing a lot in Brazil, so it was easy to find uh, jobs and uh, or more easily, more easy than in bad times to find jobs. So. Uh, as the economy now is in a different stage, the, the challenge is even bigger uh, to make sure that uh, the positive trend continues. A big challenge in Brazil was the competition was really that you can do, uh, in terms of the short courses, a lot of, uh, of, of very specific skills, very technical skills. But the foundation, the cognitive knowledge of the person is built way before, like like uh, like saying. And there, and in the general education, there are there are some challenges in terms of the quality in Brazil that uh, that are very important. So addressing those is key for the success of any education that goes after that. And then the, this idea that uh, the technical education was was an elite type of education, so making it reach more the poor was also a challenge that uh, that was very important. Another. He seen in Brazil that, uh, especially now with the more difficult labor market, was the link with the labor programs, with intermediation programs, with experience on the workplace, apprenticeship, and more experience of the teachers or the trainers as workers uh, in the same sectors, and also the adoption of uh, innovative methods to get uh, to the new skills. These were very important things. Um, in Chile, for example, they did an experience where they would monitor the insertion of uh, the, the the university graduates in labor markets and the wage increases, and um, and they would give this information back to students, and then they would they would themselves adjust demand by by going to the courses where where these returns were, were higher. In Brazil, because of the richness of the administrative data. At the limit, this could be done. So, investing more in monitoring and evaluation of the results of the program, um, and then giving this information to students uh, is an important challenge. That where Brazil is making a lot of progress, but um, it remains an important challenge for uh, for for their system. Right. So. Uh you're saying there's a lot of potential for the information available to be used to better assess 
the outcomes, and that there there's a plan to do that, or they're they're not really doing it. Yes. So as part of uh, of a study that we did with uh, with on uh, this, this study that we did, the Confederation of Industry uh, released all their administrative records and. Together we link them with Hajj, which is um, the matched employer-employee data set that uh, all firms have to report for social security purpose. So by doing that, um, they could see exactly what were the insertion rates in each of the type of courses they had in the uh, and trace the, the wage of the person before and after. So in this sense, yes, but giving the information back to students and doing it beyond this one experience with uh, with this institution and expanding it to general education and to the other providers of training beyond this big one is something that it remains a challenge for Brazil for sure and for many other countries. Right. And I'm just wondering whether you know Brazil's system, for example, in China, I know that it, they're trying to really have mass vocational education for about half of their high school age population. I mean, is it the same way in Brazil, or is it a much smaller proportion of the population that gets vocational training or technical training, and therefore it's easier to sort of manage that with the resources you have from the confederative industries? It is still a small proportion. It's about three mil, but it's about three million people, three million students, uh, just for the confederation of the industry. And uh, I think for technical education is about 13.5% of full students, so um, these are large numbers, but uh, again, these are also expensive programs that in the case of vocational training are financed through 1% tax of each firm in the sector. We didn't assess the cost effectiveness of, uh, of the courses, we just assessed uh, the returns, the private returns to the, to the students who engaged in the course. But, so, you know, this, all this discussion on results and on cost effectiveness is pretty much in the agenda now in Brazil where you know um, the, the, the fiscal situation is now also more much more constrained and and uh, for firms the demand side is more constrained okay, one okay. of the questions if if I may is it okay Albert um, yeah sure go ahead jump in there just one of the other things that I wonder about when I hear about returns to vocational and technical training a lot of the reading that I've done has really talked about the returns to vocational education versus not receiving vocational education just going into the labor market. But I think another margin that we have to think about is the returns to going to vocational, for example, high school in China uh, or in India versus going to a general education. Uh, and studies that we've done have shown that, you know, on the margin it's much better to go to an academic high school. I'm wondering if in Brazil or these other countries if really that type of thing has been assessed. Uh, to understand, you know, to what degree we should be pushing vocational education. In the context of the study on Brazil, we did a, there was a module on the household survey where they had asked everybody whether they had done a technical education or whether they had gone through the through the general track, academic track, and we did compare the returns, and they were very good. But again, the social economic background was very. Uh, was really an elite um, because the data was for 2007. Right. So I think uh, there is now um, in the last uh, household survey a new module, extra module also on vocational on on technical education. Um, it, it hasn't existed since 2007, but last year they had it. So it, it's important to reassess it now. Right, I, and you know some research that I've done for China suggests that. After the expansion of vocational education, you really did see the returns to vocational high school in China go down. You know, which is maybe not surprising given how many millions of people they were uh, trying to, uh, to train. So yeah, definitely lower relative uh, to general um, education. So uh, this has been a very informative discussion in terms of thinking about what are the key um, factors that affect the eff effectiveness of uh, vocational schooling in the different countries and. Um, I wanted to just summarize a few of the key points that I'm hearing from the discussion. You know, one is uh, really thinking about how uh, how to link supply, the content of supply to the demand, given that the specific nature of labor demand in fast-changing economies, especially these emerging market countries, is going to be changing quite a lot. 
And I think there's some elements of, uh, of success in Brazil, seemingly more than the other two systems where there's less involvement of industry. Also, everybody has been emphasizing, you know, the need or thinking harder about how to improve training in non-cognitive skills and whether that is just a feature of general education or that somehow can be incorporated effectively even in uh, technical or vocational uh, training programs. I'm curious to think about whether th the trade-off is as stark as uh, Prashant was framing. Is it an either or, vocational or general, or can we also think of mixed models where uh, even for, especially at the high school level, vocational training programs have uh, devote some of their time to some general education or certainly development of non kind of skills. So I was wondering if people felt that was also, uh, you know, something that uh, we should uh, consider. And then the other thing that I, that I'm hearing, especially in Prashant's description of China, is that the institutional incentives are extremely important. Uh, that uh, if you're just having a huge government-driven subsidized program <laughs> with little accountability, then you're not. I mean, it'll be tough to expect. Uh, a very good uh, outcome. So I'm wondering if any of you would like to add any other thoughts on how, assuming there is a role for vocational education, no matter how small, uh, that there are certainly some skills that uh, that can benefit, especially from public provision, if the supply side, I mean the demand side, kind of doesn't want to pay for skills because they're not clear they can retain the workers, then there could be this uh, uh, rational, uh, justified role for public provision of, of these things. Are there other issues that you think uh, are important or that you'd like to emphasize before we close about how we can make vocational systems more effective? Albert, I just wanted to clarify yeah. that I don't think it's an either or between vocational and academic high school, um, okay. but I do think there have been these sort of artificial numbers that have been created, like we should make a 50-50 split in China or a 30-70% split in Indonesia, that sort of these mandated numbers that really have very little to do with thinking long term about what the country needs or even in the short term about what types of skill needs there are. So I think on the margin, you know, we, we've done research and we've found that it's important to expand academic high school more. Um, and I think the other part is that, again, what you hit on the head was that there needs to be more accountability for this mass vocational system that just sprung up basically in the last 10 years. Um, and, you know, just to add a little bit of fire to that, we've done a project, a big randomized control trial in one of the provinces of China to actually work with industry. Uh, we're working with the entire electronics industry uh, under a citizenship coalition uh, that they've created and uh, the government of a certain province and the schools and basically created a credentialing system where we reward schools that do well in teaching their kids vocational skills, uh, general skills that reduce dropouts and that are responsible about internship standards, which is important for firms. Um, and after having run this program for a year, we find that there's huge increases uh, in terms of student skills um, in vocational, general re reductions in dropout, improvements in behavior. And I think this is just like coming into a situation in which there was absolutely no assessment and accountability, and now we're adding it, and boom, everything just shoots up. Um, so I think there is hope for vocational education, um, but again, it has to really be done carefully and thoughtfully, maybe like what they're doing in Brazil in certain instances. Right. Ashish or Joanna, do you want to add any final thoughts? Y yeah. Um, so I want to I want to just echo uh, what Prashant just said, um, and maybe back it up with a little bit of an example. So one of the things we've been doing in the past couple of years is going around some factories in India and talking to employers about, about what they're looking for, taking factory tours and sort of seeing what people actually do at work. And where do they get these workers from? Do they come through internships, et cetera, et cetera? Um, so qualitative view, but uh, I think quite, quite useful. So visited a factory that was making household appliances. I can't say much more than that without giving the game away. Um, and um, what we encountered was quite interesting. One room, right? So two rooms next door to each other. And in one room, uh, we have a group of women who are working in air conditioning, who have been with the firm for 20 years. The firm opened a creche for them, raised their children. Then the creche closed as the children get, got older. The women are still there. Um, highly skilled work. And they just keep doing it. And 
There is no question of ever losing these people. Uh, in the next room, we have people who are boxing up these household, household appliances. And these are young men. They come in for internships, I believe, off the top of my head, it was about 18 months at the, at the max, maybe nine months, something like that. Um, they do not get hired afterwards. The government supports the internship. Uh, managers told me um, one of the things we love about the internships is this is free labor. It's non-unionizable. Uh, and these are people who come in, and they bring great energy to the job. Um, but this is not about skill. To be clear, these are not people who require any particular skill to put the, put the, put the, put the thing in a box and move it along. Um, so you take these big supply-driven pushes, like, like, like Prashant is saying, and you push them right, in a sort of blind sort of way and say, OK, we're going we're gonna to shove them at an industry, and we're going to sort of see what sticks. Well, what sticks is where there's demand for skill, people take it up and they use it properly. And when there isn't demand for skill, they'll abuse it. Um, and that's just normal. That's just business. That's what's going to happen. So the thought is really, 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 we have to think carefully about incentive structures. How do we make sure that before an employer says, I want a piece of that pie, and I want workers to invest a year of their lives in training in something, that the employer has to say, right, at the end of this, there is a short-term job contract for you long enough to recover your investment on the employer side. We need to have something similar for the workers so that, you know, and the workers typically are putting in sweat equity, so that's there. Um, and somehow bridging that, making sure that the information flows, as Joanna says, go through so that people know when they sign up that they're not just signing up at a fly-by-night place where there's not a job at the end of it. Um, all of that is really, really important. And so those contracting relationships start to become extremely important as a means of forcing firms to express demand and put their money where their mouth is. And then this stuff really stands a chance of doing a lot of good. Great. Thanks, Ashish. Joanna? So uh, to agree, it's not either or, because they really fulfill different roles. Um, and the, the, the key for success appears to be really the linkage with the private sector, ensuring that it exists, that they are involved in the curricula, in what is taught, but also this idea of collecting information on the placements of students, on the wage increases, and then feeding them back to the programs. Um, in the case of the poor, clearly uh, guaranteeing access to, to these programs is not, uh, it, it is very, very important. So. So this was something that I wanted to add because for the poor, really, the skill set is very important for uh, really getting into the sustainable way out of poverty. And, uh, and, and many times among the poor, the asymmetry of information is even higher. And again, in Brazil, there is a very big a training provider that is very high quality, but there are many other smaller training providers and a shining building doesn't make for a good training, right? So. This asymmetry of information when you buy the training before you, you and then only after will you realize that the result is very important to have in mind, as well as the importance of the, the skill formation for the poor uh, and for adults. Uh, and finally, this idea of innovative methods that um, there are many experiences in the world, the fab labs in, uh, in MIT, the simulated environments in Holland. The, 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 there are so many interesting ways of bringing the practical examples to the, to the classroom that these really should be taken to, into account. And the final one on the, um, on the social-emotional skills. Um, it shouldn't be just social-emotional skills. There was a time in Brazil where there were trainings that just consisted in social-emotional skills, uh, and they weren't such a great success. The understanding uh, in Brazil from that experience is that a combination of uh, of both is very very important in the trainings. So um, good results were also achieved uh, in in Colombia. There is a very important study that just came out, where like you like colleagues were saying, the the results are not just for the person, even for the other members of the family. Their life improved as a result of this uh, investment in skills. So. Um, really a, a, an optimistic view. <laughs> training can work. Training does work in many places. And really, the key is demand. And the, the poor should not be uh, excluded from, from them, from the, the training. Right. Thanks for that uh, optimistic uh, close to our discussion, Joanna. And I, pr I particularly appreciated 
uh, you're pointing out, you know, these issues of information asymmetry, with, which I think are really at the heart of the matter. You know, a poor person trying to get a job may not actually know all the time where the demand is, and that there needs to be a mechanism to convey that information effectively through the institutions that make the choices and create the opportunities for different types of training. And I think, you know, in today's world, we have so mu we have uh, such better ability to process information. Uh, potentially with technological advances that hopefully we can figure out how to use that technology meaningfully to solve some of these uh, information problems that are at the core of some of the issues that have been raised today. So with that, I'd like to thank all of our uh, three uh, speakers, presenters, uh, discussants at today's uh, Google Hangout and uh, close today's session. I think it was a very stimulating discussion. I think everybody got a very good sense about the difficult challenges but important role that vocational education can play in emerging markets. So thank you all very much.